Hello everyone, Gecko here. Are you wondering why I'm stood in the middle of this big field? Well, today I'm going up, up, up into the sky in a brilliant hot air balloon. Hot air balloons come in all sorts of different colours, shapes and sizes. And they work a little bit like this gecko balloon I've got here. This balloon is filled with a gas called helium, which is lighter than the air outside the balloon. That means, if I was to let this go, the balloon would fly upwards into the sky. Can you believe that a whole hot air balloon is packed up in this small trailer behind me? This is Ed and Ben. Ed's a hot air balloon pilot. They're unpacking the balloon and getting it ready for today's flight. This part is called the basket and that's where the people go. Next, Ed and Ben connect the burners to the basket. The burners are like the engine. They use fire to heat up the air inside the balloon to make it float high up into the sky. Hello, Ed. Hi, Gecko. Do you want to come for a balloon flight? Oh, yes, please. I'm so excited, Ed. Now it's time to attach the big balloon. Ed and Ben work as a team. Woohoo! Wow! This bag holds the entire balloon inside it. I'll let you into a little secret. Balloon pilots don't call this part the balloon. They call it the envelope. Whoa! Look how big it is! This is a fan. And Ed uses it to quickly fill the envelope with air. That's called inflation. It's getting bigger! Wow! This is what it's like inside the inflated balloon. Amazing! Remember, the balloon will only fly into the sky if the air inside is lighter. My old gecko balloon used helium gas, but this balloon heats the air inside and hot air rises. So now it's time to turn the burners on. As the air inside gets hotter, the envelope starts to float upwards. OK, Gecko, we're all set. It's up, up and away. Here we go! To go up, Ed fires up the burners, which pushes more hot air into the envelope. Woo! We're going higher and higher and higher! Wow! We're flying over fields, houses and villages. I feel like my old explorer friend, Phileas Frog. Ed, when did you realise you wanted to be a hot air balloon pilot? So Gecko, my parents took me to my first balloon festival when I was two years old and I was hooked. And then uh, about the age of four I decided that's what I wanted to do, I wanted to be a hot air balloon pilot. And here we are. It's so amazing to see the world from so high up. All of the people and cars look like little ants. It's the perfect place for a game of sky high, I spy with my little eye. I spy with my little eye, something beginning with... T town. I spy with my little eye, something beginning with... 
R. River. Where are we going to, Ed? In fact, how do you steer this thing? Good question, Gecko. Well, there's no steering wheel, so we can't steer it like a car or an aeroplane. And if you're in the garden, you let a balloon go, it just flies away. So that's what happens with us. But we can use winds at different heights. Winds at different levels, they are different layers, and they will slightly go different directions. So using my experience as a pilot, I can use those winds to kind of steer to where I want to go. Because we don't quite know where we're going to end up, our old friend Ben is following us in the truck and he'll meet us in whatever field we land in. To make the balloon come down ready for landing, Ed stops heating the air inside the envelope. As the air inside cools, the balloon starts to float down. If he wants to make the balloon come down more quickly, Ed can lift a flap in the top of the envelope, which makes the hot air escape out of the top. And here we go. We're going down. I'm going to crouch down inside the basket and turn Gecko Cam on. Get ready for landing, everyone. Woohoo! What a thrill! And here's Ben, right on time to come and help us pack the balloon away. Wowzers trousers! That really was a fantastic adventure floating across the sky. Thanks to everyone at Virgin Balloon Flights for showing us their magnificent hot air balloon in action. Until next time, it's Cheerio from Gecko. Bye! Everyone, Gecko here. It's nice to be driving along with my old friend, Mr. T. Gecko, I've got something amazing to show you today. I've been really busy creating a brand new ice cream factory. Wow, that sounds so cool. Can we go and have a look? Yeah, I've already got your friends, the mechanicals there now, setting everything up for us. What? You've left the mechanicals on their own? In an ice cream factory? Uh-oh, that spells trouble. Let's hope there's no more mechanical mischief today. Now that the factory's squeaky clean again, please can you show me around? I think the best way for me to show you how my ice cream factory works, Gecko, is to make a brand new ice cream flavour. What do you think? I think that sounds delicious. But first, we need to put our protective clothes on. Let's get ice cream making! First, Mr T needs to make a special milk mix in this really big tank. He adds five bags of milk powder to some water. One, two, three, four, five! He gives it a stir with his big paddle to make sure it's mixing just fine. Then he adds sugar for sweetness and a few more secret ingredients. We're going to make a special gecko ice cream. So Mr T adds some bright green lime flavour. To make the mix into ice cream, you have to make it really, really cold so that it freezes. 
the mix gets moved from this big tank into the freezing machine. So Gecko, come on, let's do it. Let's make some lovely ice cream for you. But what are we going to make, Mr. T? We're gonna make a lovely Gecko's Green ice cream dream just for you. So first of all, Gecko, what we do is we get the machine and we open it there and we get lots of ice cream coming out. Yummy, yummy, yummy. Wow, look at the ice cream all coming out. Look at it swirling around, Gecko. It is absolutely delicious. Ooh, look at the colour of that. Gecko, look at this. It's a lovely lime green flavour just for you. My favourite colour's green. Wow, there's loads in there. Well, Gecko, you have got an appetite, haven't you? So, Gecko, first of all, on your lovely ice cream, we are going to put on some blue bubblegum sauce. And the second sauce that we're going to put on Gecko is going to be some lovely, lovely strawberry sauce. Wow. And then, after that, because it's a special green ice cream just for you, we are going to put lots of these lovely green crunch crystals all over. I'm sure you're going to enjoy this one, Gecko. And we're going to be healthy and put some lovely fruit on which is some of these nice green kiwis. Ooh, I love kiwi fruit. Kiwi is the best. And always remember, kids, make sure you have plenty of fruit. There. Doesn't that look amazing, Gecko? And then we got some lovely, lovely geckos. Wow. We'll get some of these lovely spanner cookies. Wow, look at them. We'll pop them in there. I think this is going to be amazing, this ice cream. So here we are then, Gecko is finally ready. Your masterpiece, Gecko's Green Ice Cream Dream. Wow, thank you so much, Mr. T. That looks delicious. I tell you what, Mr. T, it doesn't get much better than this. Absolutely, Gecko. I couldn't agree more. Thanks very much to Mr. T for showing us around his amazing ice cream factory today. For now, it's cheerio from me and Mr. T. Bye! Hello, everyone! I'm here with Mr. T, the ice cream man. And we're going to be making a super spooky Halloween ice cream. Yes, Gecko. Today we're going to make a horrible Halloween ice cream. But first, I think we need to change into our Halloween costumes. Yes, yes, Gecko. Look at me. I'm a mad scientist. <laughs> and I am a scary vampire. <laughs> I hope there's no garlic in the ice cream. What's next, Mr. T? We're going to make ice cream in a witch's cauldron today. We're filling the cauldron up with ice cream, Gecko. And then we're going to put lots of ghoulish sweeties on there. Wowzers! That cauldron fits a lot of ice cream in it. I've never seen an ice cream that big. Look at that, Gecko. Now we're all ready to put some ghoulish, gory toppings on top of your ice cream. Oh, this is my favourite bit. Let's start off with these red-blooded snakes. Absolutely horrible. Horrible, I say. There we have the eyes of a newt picked this morning. Ooh, these sweeties are creepy. And we have the heart of a frog and the teeth of a vampire. Oh dear. That doesn't sound good for me. 
And now we have some spooky chocolate crumbles. And then on top of this, we put some powdered vampire's blood. And some lovely, lovely, horrible snakes. And now we have some wizard's teardrops. Yes. Now we're done with the sweeties. I think we should add some tasty sauce. Now that looks to me like gooey werewolf's blood. <laughs> and to finish off this masterful, ghoulishly creative ice cream, we are going to add the famous beetle juice. <laughs> And there we have it, Mr. T's ghoulishly gory Halloween ice cream. <laughs> and we all scream for ice cream. Thanks very much to Mr. T for his amazing Halloween ice cream creation. And thank you for watching. We'll see you again soon. Happy, Happy Halloween. Halloween! Bye! Hello everyone, Gecko here. I'm here at the Tarmac Quarry to meet an amazing freight train. Behind me is the locomotive. This is the part of the train that has the engine inside it and it's where the driver sits. And these are the wagons. Whoa, there's loads of them. Look, the locomotive is being connected to that long, long chain of wagons. These parts are called buffers. Buffers slow down the locomotive and the wagons at the last second and stop them crashing into each other. These big hooks are connected to each other. This is called coupling. These pipes connect the air brakes from the locomotive to the wagons. That's so the train can stop. Blue Mechanical, what are you doing in that wagon? Well, okay, I suppose you can't cause any damage in there. Please just stay out of trouble whilst I go and learn how you drive a freight train. This is Matt and he's operations manager here. Let's go and have a sneak peek inside the driver's cab. So Matt, how do you drive a freight train? Right Gecko, thanks for asking. Very, very simply, we have a power throttle here, that makes us go faster. And if we want to stop, we have some braking systems. We have two. One, if we're only a locomotive by ourselves, and the other one if we've got wagons attached. If it goes really wrong, we hit the red button and this stops us immediately. And for any naughty people we see on the track, we sound our horn to let them know we're coming. This freight train works really hard, taking special stone all over the country. This stone is used to build houses, roads and even schools. First, the stone has to be blasted from the ground. Big trucks like excavators and dump trucks work together to move this stone around. The stone is then crushed to make all of the pieces much smaller. But how do they get this stone from the quarry all the way over to the train's wagons? Well, Inside these tunnels are amazing things called conveyor belts. They're a bit like magic moving carpets. They carry the stone all the way up and across to where the train's parked. And the conveyor belt finishes here, just above the wagons. The 
stone falls out of a chute into the empty wagons. Amazing! When each wagon is full, the driver drives the train forwards, ready for the next empty wagon to be loaded up. And that's it! The wagons are all full, so it's time for the train to start its journey. Oh no! I totally forgot! Blue Mechanical's still in one of the wagons! Sit tight, Blue! We'll catch up with you at the next tarmac depot! The train will now travel through this beautiful countryside for two hours before it arrives in the city ready to be unloaded and turned into special building material. Freight trains are amazing because they can carry so much stuff. Over 30 houses could be built from all of the stone carried in this one train. More wagons mean less lorries on the road too, because this freight train carries the same amount as 70 lorries. Wow! And here's the train, right on time. This is the Tarmac Cross Green Depot in Leeds. The train drives along the tracks and into this shed called the Rail Offload Shed. This is Phil, and he's the rail offloader. He can talk to the driver on this walkie-talkie and ask him to stop or go. Once the first set of wagons are in the shed, Phil can empty the stone out. Hop out, Blue Mechanical, before the stone disappears. Oof. Phil pulls these levers and the doors on the bottom of the wagon open. Wow, that was close, Blue. All of the stone slides out of the bottom, a bit like water going down the plug hole in the bath. The stone falls down below onto another conveyor belt, which carries the stone up and into the tarmac plant, where it can be mixed with other ingredients and turned into concrete or asphalt. That's the stuff that's used to build houses, schools, hospitals and roads. The final step is for big trucks to load up and take the material to building sites ready for construction. I've loved learning all about the important job that freight trains do. Thanks very much to all of the team at Tarmac for letting us tag along. For now, it's Cheerio from Gecko. Bye! Hello everyone! Today we're learning all about these helpful little forklift trucks. Forklift trucks are used in all sorts of different places, like factories and warehouses. They can lift and move things that are too heavy to be lifted by people. And they can reach much higher than we can. This is a training centre where people are taught how to drive forklifts. And my friend Florence has come along to get some tips too. This is Robbie and he's a forklift truck expert. So today he's going to show us all of the amazing things that these vehicles can do. Welcome to FLT, Gecko. Are you ready for your training? Oh yes, Robbie. With all of these forklifts whizzing around, it's important to stay safe. To make sure everyone can see me, I'm wearing this bright yellow high visibility jacket. With this on, I'll certainly stand out. It's called a forklift because of these two big forks on the front. They're super strong and can lift very heavy things. Shall we see just how much a forklift can pick up? OK, Florence, you go first. Can you lift me? Woohoo! I'm so high! OK, you can put me down now, thanks, Florence. OK, 
can you lift? Five mechanicals. One, two, three, four, five. Well done, Robbie. Florence, can you lift Mabel and her family? Carefully don't swing off you. Woo! Oh, wow! Robbie's going one better and lifting up a rhinoceros. He looks heavy. These forklifts can lift an impressive one and a half tons which is the weight of this large rhino. A forklift has lots of different features to make it the perfect lifting vehicle. Robbie, can you please show us how to drive a forklift truck? Well, Gecko, it's quite simple. We have two pedals I need to use. One's the accelerator, second one's a brake. Use the accelerator to go and brake to stop. I have the steering wheel here. I turn it left, it'll go left. I turn it right, it'll go right. All I do is press the middle of the steering wheel for the horn. Oh, sorry, mechanicals. Did I scare you there? <laughs> These three levers control the all-important fork. Robbie can use this lever to make the forks move up. And down. Up. And down. He can use this lever to move them left and right. Left and right. And he can use this lever to tip them forwards and backwards. Forwards and backwards. These are called pallets and they are the main things that forklifts are designed to lift and move. Some things are far too heavy or too high up to pick up with just your bare hands. So this helpful forklift does the job. The forks fit perfectly into the pallets which have heavy objects on top of them. Robbie then lifts the pallet up and carries it where it needs to go. Sometimes they need lifting back onto the high shelves. I know I couldn't reach up there. Normally vehicles are steered using the wheels at the front, but look! It's the wheels at the back that are turning. Wow, look at them whiz and spin around that course. It almost looks like they're dancing. Here comes the forklift, he's so clever. Moving the parts around the store. Here comes the forklift, it goes forever. They put them down upon the floor. He turns to the left and reaches high. He turns to the right as he passes. Super strong and it can go, go, go! Show them what you can do, forklift! Left! Right! Up! Down! Round! And round! And round! And round! And round! And up and down! Here comes the forklift, he's so clever Moving the parts around the store Here comes the forklift, it goes forever They put them down upon the floor He turns to the left and reaches high He turns to the right as he passes by Forklift picks up things from down, down low It's super strong and it can go, go, go It's tiring work having all this fun. 
It looks like these busy trucks have run out of energy too. Look at that. Robbie's flipped open the forklift, like opening the lid on a box of toys. All of these trucks are powered by electricity. Robbie plugs them into the main power supply so the batteries can recharge, ready for another day of lifting, carrying and moving. Thanks to Robbie and all the team at FLT Liverpool for teaching us all about these hard-working forklift trucks. We'll see you again soon. Bye! Can I get down now, Robbie? Robbie? Robbie! Hello, everyone! I'm here at Claremont Farm today to learn all about tractors. Tractors are the most important vehicle on the farm. They help farmers like Andy and his family do really big jobs, like planting a whole field of potatoes. Let's get out on the road. Oh dear, I think I'm on the wrong tractor. Andy? Ah, here's Andy now, with a much newer blue tractor. Andy, can you show us round your beautiful tractor, please? OK, the front of the tractor. These are the heavy weights. So if we're picking up machinery at the back, we don't want the tractor to flip up. So these keep it all straight and on the ground. These are our lights. Sometimes we have to work at night and we need as much light as possible. So not only do we have the headlights, but we have spotlights at the top as well. This is the exhaust pipe. We don't want the exhaust at the back with all the machinery, so we keep it up front here and it's high so we're not breathing in the fumes. This is the huge tractor tire with big tractor tread here. If it's really wet and muddy in the field, we need as much traction as possible because we don't want to be slipping. The back of the tractor. This is where we connect all the implements. This is called three-point linkage. One, two, three. This goes down and picks the machinery up at the back. And this is my tractor. Thanks, Andy. Tractors can drive on roads, but muddy fields are where tractors can really get to work. The huge wheels mean they'll never lose grip, no matter how sticky it gets. But that doesn't stop it being really bumpy. Whoa! In the spring, it's time for the farmers to get into the tractor and plant some seed potatoes. They drive in straight lines, creating these lovely neat rows. Imagine doing all of this planting by hand. It would take ages. But luckily, with the help of a tractor, you can plant a whole field in just two days. Deep under the ground, those little potatoes are busy spreading and growing into lots of new potatoes all throughout the year. Farmers rely on the changing of the seasons. Spring, summer, autumn and winter to help their crops grow. It's now autumn and the leaves are falling off the trees. Out in the fields, we're going to be using the tractor to dig up the potatoes that we planted. They've been growing all summer long. You can put all sorts of different equipment onto the back of a tractor and today, the farmer's attaching a huge potato harvester. Now we're connected, it's away we go! The tractor pulls along the harvester as it pulls out the potatoes from the ground. The potatoes shoot up through the harvester and make their way down this conveyor belt where the farmer checks all of the potatoes. He throws away any bad ones. Once all the potatoes are collected, the harvester lifts them up and tips them into a trailer. 
the farmer then hooks up the trailer and takes the potatoes back to the farmyard. Back at base, the farmers open the trailer up and push the potatoes onto another conveyor belt that creates a massive potato mountain. Think of all the mashed potato you can make out of that. Now let's have a look at how you drive a tractor. So this is my tractor cab. This is my steering wheel. And all modern tractors now have power steering, which means that it's easier to turn the big wheels in the field. Here, this red lever, this means the tractor can go forward or back. Forward or back. Here, this is where we turn the lights on. On this side, we have the hare and the tortoise. This is slow and this is fast. We have 15 different gears on a tractor. It's from very, very slow to fast on the road. So, do you remember seeing that big mountain of potatoes? Well, we can't see them now. And here they are. So we have to cover the potatoes with straw. The straw keeps them nice and warm to stop the frost getting in during the winter, but it also stops the light getting in. If a potato sees the light, it turns green and then we can't eat it. So it has to be completely dark. Once the potatoes are ready, they make their way to the kitchen where they're washed, peeled and chopped into chips by the chefs in the kitchen. Look at that! Fresh potatoes straight from the field and onto the plate. Yum! I've loved learning all about the different jobs that a tractor can do on the farm. Without these amazing vehicles, farmers wouldn't be able to grow all of those tasty vegetables that end up on your plate. Thanks very much to Andy and everyone at Claremont Farm for teaching us all about their tractors. We'll see you again soon. Bye! Hello everyone! I'm at a racetrack in Spain to meet some really fast racing cars. These Formula E racing cars are special because they're powered by electricity. This is Robin and this is Sam. They're racing drivers for the Envision Virgin Racing Formula E team. They're also teammates. Their job is to drive around the racetrack in the fastest time possible and hopefully win the race. Today, the team are testing out their cars before the racing season begins. Testing's like practice, and practice makes perfect. But first, we need to put the car together. First, the mechanics cool down the car with dry ice, which is a super cold gas. Then they place the rear wing into position. And screw into place. The front nose of the car is attached next. Once the helpful mechanics have put the car together, it's time for the drivers to get ready. Racing drivers wear these big helmets to keep them super safe when out on the track. It connects to a neck guard, which keeps the driver nice and secure. They also wear these really smart overalls, which show their team colours. I guess that means I'm in the Envision Virgin Racing team too. Then the gloves go on to protect their hands. After a quick chat with the team engineer, it's time for the drivers to strap themselves into the car. First, Sam jumps in. Then Robin. Both drivers have different helmets so the team know who's who out on the track. Robin has an orange helmet and Sam has a white one. Formula E cars have detachable steering wheels. 
that means they can take them off so the driver can squeeze into the car and then put them back on again, ready to race. The mechanics do some last minute checks on the car. And then it's ready to get out onto the track. The pit crew are all part of the same team and they check that the track is clear. The driver gives a thumbs up to say he's ready and the crew give him the go ahead. Both Sam and Robin leave their garages and drive down to the pit lane. We're almost ready to race. Both cars stop at the end of the pit lane and wait to be told to enter the track. If a car is going past, they can't join the track yet, as that would cause a crash. Ready, set, go! Ready, set, go! This is the bit I've been looking forward to the most. Look how fast these cars can go! In fact, the top speed of a Formula E racing car is 150 miles per hour. That's as fast as the flight dive of a golden eagle. Now the other teams are out on the track. It's time to see who can get the fastest time. This car's misjudged the turn. Whoa, he spun out of control. Can anyone go round this corner correctly? Here's our friend Robin. I hope he doesn't mess it up. Way, he's done it. Well done, Robin. Formula E racing cars are powered by electricity, which means they don't burn any dirty fuel. This is much better for the environment while still having lots of fun. It also means the cars are a lot quieter than normal race cars. Not only do the drivers have to drive around the track, they always need to be checking their energy levels, car temperature, and they need to be speaking to their engineers, all whilst driving. It's a real team effort from everyone. Look, there's a live map of where everyone is on the racing track. I think we've got the call to go back into the pits. The cars slow down and enter the pit lane. The pit crew come out to greet them. Racing cars don't have a reverse gear, so the team have to push the cars back into the garage themselves. Oof, that looks heavy. That's one in. And here's the other. As soon as the car enters the garage, the crew tests the temperature of the car. It's a bit like when your mummy or daddy check your forehead when you're not feeling very well. It's a good way to find out how you're feeling. The car seems a little hot, so it's cooled down with these fans. I think Sam might be hot too. Formula E is a real team game, and it's not just the two drivers that do all of the work. There are more than 50 people in the Envision Virgin Racing team. There's lots of different jobs, like engineers, mechanics, or technicians. The crew have the incredibly important job of making sure the car is the best it can possibly be. And that means looking after it too. The car's worn all its tyres on the track, burning all that rubber on the baking hot road. So we need a fresh new set.
This is the control room, home to the clever technicians and engineers. It's their job to keep a close eye on the car whilst it's on the track and come up with new ways to make the car go even faster. It's with these big headsets that they talk to the drivers when they're out on the racetrack. Here comes Sam now. This is his chance to talk to his team and chat about how the car is performing. They all work together to make the car faster so that they can win lots of races. After this meeting, it's time to make some small changes to the car. And then we're back on the track. Racing cars are super speedy, powered by a battery pack. Electric cars are hard to beat. team will be testing out the cars all day on this track to make sure they are at their best when it comes to race day. I've had a great day here in Valencia with the Envision Virgin Racing Formula E team. Thanks very much to all the team. I hope you've learned as much as I have about these clean energy racing cars. I'll see you again soon. Bye! If you love this video, tap here so you're the first to know about my latest videos. Thanks for watching! Bye!